Esau and Jacob. Jacob had a, uh, a tough moment. He was a deceiver, a heel grabber. That's what his name means. And um, he had gotten himself in a position where he was in the north. He defended his father-in-law and had to leave. But to go south, he was going to have to deal with his brother, who he also offended. He was caught between a rock and a hard place, a mad father-in-law and a brother who had last talked to him about killing him. And so he was in a bad spot. Now, I want to talk to you about limps and how to get one, because I'm kind of limping here today. In my dad's town, Denora, Pennsylvania, there was a guy, I'm changing all the names, I'm changing the place where he fought, but there was a man with a limp, and he had a decided limp. It was a full hip swing. And I asked my dad, what's wrong with him? Because my dad loved him. He worked in the tire shop of Abe Rubin. And, and he asked, I said, what's, what's up with that guy? Why is he limping like that? And he told me the story that he was in the Battle of Saipan. And if you know your World War II history, it's a, it's a terrible battle. And he was injured fighting for our country. And from then on to me, he wasn't limping, Sam. He was Saipan, Sam, right? And that limp told me of a man who risked his life for me. Now, I'm limping because, strangely enough, I played Rocket League two nights ago with my son, a video game. There's no glory in that limp, is there? <laughs> so you can just think of me as Idiot Kirk or something like that. We're going to find out that Jacob picks up a limp. And that story is, I've referred to it before we get to here, but here's what we're going to mean by it. Let's tell the story. So let's talk about how much trouble in Genesis 32 Jacob finds himself. He's the grandson of Abraham. He's the grandson of the promise, but he has just manipulated. He's stolen the blessing. He's stolen the birthright. Even though God said he would have it, he felt like he had to do it his way. And so everywhere he turns, he's running into consequences. Messengers return to Jacob saying, we, sent, we went to your brother Esau, and now he is coming to meet you, and 400 men are with him. So Jacob has every, every reason to believe Esau's coming to kill him. In great fear and distress, Jacob divided the people who were with him. He, he went to Haran, this place in the north, with nothing. And he's coming back with four, two wives, two mistresses, and 11 children, flocks and herds. So in great fear and distress, Jacob divides all of this, the people who are with him, into two groups, flocks, herds, camels. He thought if Esau comes and attacks one group, the group that is left may escape. Now God has called him to go back, but here he is still scheming, still planning. Here's his map, and the red line is, is Esau coming from the south, from his area, to meet Jacob at the city, what would be known as Peniel. Or Peniel. And there's a, there's a river running left to right called the Jabbok. It's really a stream. Here's the terrain. I wanted to show you this because this is rough terrain. This is more than the Flint Hills. It's some combination of the Flint Hills and Utah. Just barren. And it's a long walk through hard territory. Coming from Edom is Esau. Coming from Haran is Jacob. And they, they're about to meet. So Jacob prayed, O God of my father. And Brad talks so well about this uh, prayer. Listen to it. Listen to the, to the becoming more and more honest with the Lord. Jacob is growing up. O oh God of my father Abraham, God of my father Isaac, Lord who said to me, go back to your country and your relatives and I will make you prosper. Understand that's God's name, by the way, because that's his experience. He's praying to the God he's experienced. I am unworthy of all the kindness and faithfulness you've shown your servant. I had only my staff when I crossed this Jordan, but now I've become two camps. Save me, I pray, from the hand of my brother Esau, for I am afraid he will come and attack me and also the mothers with their children. He may as well be praying, save me from my consequences, which is still a legitimate prayer, amen? But you have said, I will surely make you prosper. And this is the first time he remembers God's promises. And make your descendants like the sand of the sea, which cannot be counted. So he spent the night there, and from what he had with him, he selected a gift for his brother Esau. 200 female goats, 20 male goats, 200 ewes, 20 rams. That's a lot. 30 female camels, 40 cows, 10 bulls, 20 female donkeys, 10 male donkeys. And he separates them so that as, as Esau makes his way, he's going to meet each and every part of this gift. More and more impressive. It's sort of like, wait, there's more. <laughs> wait, there's more. Oh, Esau, don't kill me, because I don't have 400 men. 
And he instructed the first and the second, just do this. And for he thought, I will pacify him with these gifts I'm sending on ahead. Later when I see him, perhaps he won't kill me. Perhaps he'll receive me. So Jacob's gifts went on ahead of him, but he himself spent the night in the camp. What a, what a, it, it, when Abraham Lincoln does the um, Gettysburg Address, he, he writes wonderfully. And every once in a while has a short, powerful sentence. And so the war came. And here's one. But he himself spent the night in the camp. You can't run from yourself. And it's going to be a weird night. You ever had one? That night, Jacob got up and took his two wives, his two female servants, his 11 sons, and crossed the ford of the Jabbok. After he sent them across the stream, he sent over all his possessions, and he was alone. What happens next is crazy. A man wrestled with him till daybreak. Doesn't say who he was. But he had a wrestling mat. Do you know what Jacob's name means? Heel grabber, wrestler, deceiver. He, he's the one who grabbed onto his brother. When I introduced who Jacob and Esau were, remember it was hairy. Esau was hairy and redheaded, and Jacob was the grabber. Hairy and the grabber. It's always been wrestling with Jacob. And it's fascinating that a man shows up and wrestles with him. You ever had a nighttime wrestling match? Not just related to burritos or something, just a, a real mental, emotional, spiritual wrestling match? This is a great question. I won't look out as I ask it because I don't want you to think I'm thinking of you. But what do you wrestle with at night? Do you ever wrestle at being alone? I've gotten into a bad habit. I put podcasts into my ears. I haven't been giving myself that alone time. And it's messing up my life. It's not a tremendous confession or anything, but you know what I mean? We, we're just jamming sounds and sights and refusing to be alone. And there's power in being alone. There's fear in being alone. Amen? Don't be afraid to be alone, especially if you know that God is good even if he wrestles with you. Why are we avoiding silence? Are we avoiding God? Does it matter what we think? Is it what's actually happening? And what does that say about our view of God if we're avoiding God? And it's funny, Ethan spoke of it, and I really appreciate, Ethan, what you said. He said, I'm avo I was avoiding God because I didn't want to do what he said. <laughs> Who else? And when you realize that, it's a great moment. It's not a tragic moment. Because God is good. And why is the visitor a wrestler? Think about this. When Abraham needed to see God, it was either God's voice or an angel. And the angels were travelers. Well, Abraham was a traveler. To Joshua, God appears as a soldier. And to Jacob as a wrestler. To us in Christ, with a man with hands and tears and blood to bleed, God comes to us so that we can see God. Amen? He accommodates himself to us. That doesn't make us, you know, a kid, a kid should grow up thinking they run the world. Unfortunately, they, do, they think that because people just do everything for them. I mean, cats think we're their servants, right? We change their litter. Are you kidding me? But in reality, it's a kindness when God appears to us so that we can understand him. It's a kindness when a father kneels down to his four-year-old son. Sometimes. It's also a kindness when he swats his butt. And that's what's happening here. So when the man, so they wrestle, and this is, this is interesting. When the man saw that he could not overpower him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, the hollow, this point right here, that every rest, you can't wrestle without this. If this goes out on you, I don't know what you can do. It's tough. And he touched the socket of Jacob's hip so that he was wrenched as he wrestled with the man. Then the man said, let me go for it's daybreak. This is just weird. Jacob has some sort of strength or is allowed to have some sort of effect on this. 
Now, could he not overpower Jacob? Could not or would not? How many of you have prayed, oh, God, show me? You know, Michaela, you got lucky with those three visitations. Was it who said they three times? Yeah, right? God will do that for us sometimes. Other times, he'll speak and then be quiet and wait. Could not overpower. There, there, you wonder, oh, oh that the, the heavens would be rendered and God would come down. Well, he did that in Christ. But he, we have to believe. And we have to decide. Convince a man against his will, he's of the same opinion still. Amen? I mean, what's really the, the wrestling match going on here? The wrestler has the power to dislocate his hip with a touch. You don't think he could have just burned him up? Sure he could have. But God doesn't treat us that way. He appeals to us. But we are not slaves. The decision to love has to have the decision to not love. Or you're not free. So who and what is this visitor fighting? Is he fighting a body or is he fighting a will? And that's my wrestling match with the Lord. Is it yours? It's the will. It's the want to. What's the goal of this match? Surrender. Tap out. Some of us are strong. Some of us are stupid. Some of us are Jacob. And I'm using some, I could say, all. We're just Jacob differently. You know, your kids are all strong-willed. They're just strong-willed differently. Have you figured that out if you have children? You might have a passive kid. Oh, buckle up. Because inside, they hate your guts. And they'll win. I'm being generalizing. But it's also true. (laughs) You got to parent differently. And God is God differently. To Joshua. To Abraham. But his point is the same. Surrender. Yield. You ever been there? I hope you have. Pray to be there. Pray to, be, pray to get your wrestling match out with God. Pray to say those things. The, 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 Eli, you've done a great job helping young people get there. God bless you. That's what we want. See the battle. You can't enter the battle for them, but you take them to the point where they can. And you help them see what they're even doing. Hey, Eli, you're a good wrestling coach. I hope I am. I hope you have wrestling coaches in your life. But it's your match. But God is good. Jacob replied, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Jacob just wants. And there, there's, God can use it. And the man, still not identified, asked him, what is your name? Last time Jacob was asked this question, who asked it in the Bible? Last time Jacob was asked this question, his father asked him because he was going to bless Esau. And Jacob lied when he was asked this question. And he didn't say, I'm Jacob. I'm just trying to steal the blessing, Dad. He said, I'm Esau. Well, now he tells the truth. Then the man says, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel. And, and what Israel means is interesting, but you, because it, it means one who wrestles with God, struggles with God. And, and in a way, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob... Jacob, the grandson of Abraham, is having his name changed to Israel. Get it? I mean, this is the point when you read the, New, the Old Testament that has to sink in. The Israelites are the children of Jacob, the grandchildren of Abraham. Jacob is going to have 12 sons and one daughter. The whole of Israelite history comes through this family. And this family's a mess. This family will wrestle with God. It'll be given here the tender commandments, and they won't keep one of them. This family looks like you and me. And from this family comes a Savior. Why? Because the family of man needs saved. Amen? The reason we're in week 30 of Genesis is so that you get deep this. Because this is our history. This is world history. There's no other world, no other earth, and no other Savior. And if there's another planet, the Savior is going to be Jesus. And, and if they have nine heads and three legs, the enfleshment will probably have nine heads and three legs. I'm really getting out there. My point to be, the God who is and who created the universe with an explosion and saves us in Jesus and did it through this family will do it wherever it needs done. 
And he said, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, because you have struggled with God and with humans and have overcome. And I, overcome, not victory over them or victory over God, but in the same sense that Jesus says, I have overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble. But fear not, for I have overcome the world. MacArthur says, Jacob's personal name changes from heel catcher, deceiver, to one meaning God fighter, or he who struggles with God. That's a big step forward. Jacob said to the guy, tell me your name. Why do you ask me my name? And then he blessed him. So he didn't answer. Jacob has to figure out who he's been wrestling with. So Jacob called the place Peniel, saying, It is because I got, saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. The sun rose above him as he passed Peniel, and he was limping because of his hip. The rest of his life, Jacob did this. Till that moment, till that night alone, he didn't do it. But now he probably did this. And he would have to explain it the rest of his life. And he wasn't quite as good a wrestler with man from that moment on. Therefore, to this day, the Israelites do not eat the tendon attached to the socket of the hip. And you could read this and say, oh, another law, another thing. No, the tender commandments and the laws are to remind us of the spiritual principles behind them. And this is just, it's just a cute family story where they remember the limp and the struggle that we all have. So questions now. Jacob is coming home with a limp. What is the limp a sign of? His struggle with God and the goodness of God and the mercy of God, actually, and the change in his life. It's a sign of his experience with himself, his experience with God, a sparing of his life for a purpose because that's how he understood it. You've spared my life. I saw God and didn't die. And so every time somebody, hey, Grandpa, why are you limping? He could tell them. The rest of his life, it became a memorial to future generations. Now, is he pure? Is this fix him? Is Jacob all good? No, but it's a limping step closer to surrender. And that's how we grow, isn't it? Did you, we were, we're suddenly saved, and that's guaranteed. But you're not suddenly grown up. You're not suddenly mature. You're not suddenly wise. But you are suddenly saved. Praise God. Do you have an experience of coming to the end of yourself where you had to stop all the BS about protecting your reputation, about explaining your past, where you had your night alone with the Lord and you said, okay, Father, take my life. Let me do it your way. And is it showing up? Is there a limp? Is there some physical sign that you've had that moment? And maybe, maybe a, a, a graceful reminder from God of your past, a scar. A limp. Do you have a limp story and does it give God glory? Because there are plenty of limp stories that have nothing to do with God. I got dog bite scars, nothing to do with God. Bobby Carinti. Remember Bobby? Youth pastor in 2000. Um, and by the way, have we not been blessed by our last two youth pastors? The, the average is 10 months, 9 to 10 months. And between um, Rachel Beth and Eli, and Eli worked with Rachel Beth, it's been 10 years. But, but you remember Bobby, he, had a, 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 he was in an automobile accident, motorcycle accident, because of his drug and gang lifestyle. And he came to us with an arm that, that didn't move. We found out he was driving in ways that we weren't crazy about, but it became part of his testimony. Hey, Bobby, why is your arm like that? I mean, it was very effective with young people. But it, it happened because of his own personality. But he gave it to God. It hurt him. It frustrated him. It frustrates him to this day. But it was part of his testimony. He caused it, but God used it. There are some limps like that in our lives. There's other limps that God will bring to us while we're in service to God. Painful relationships. Broken relationships, um, hurt and try, just all kind of issues. Even as you serve the Lord, you're going to find ways that you'll end up limping. Pastor Umar Malinde in Uganda, they threw acid in his face. He's an ex-Islamic -Isl um, leader who came to Christ. 
And the people who didn't want him to preach just threw acid in his face, and it burned him terribly. And now he has to be protected everywhere he goes. But what a testimony. What a limp. What's yours? And is it attached to God's purpose in your life? Is there a story of where you met God? Is there a place where God touched you as Savior where you now submit and see that place as a blessing? Does it announce your weakness, God's strength, or both? Corey Ten Boom served the Lord, hid Jews, and was forced into a concentration camp where her sister and her father and her brother-in-law were killed. The rest of her life, she had to limp through forgiveness issues. She couldn't forgive, but she had to. And her decisions to forgive have blessed me. And she'd been preaching on forgiveness for 20 years when who came down the aisle once in Europe but one of the guards that caused the death of her sister. And she had to forgive. And she said, I didn't want to. But my arm, haltingly, almost like a limp, I held it out. And in that moment, the Holy Spirit gave me the spirit of forgiveness. Have you ministered from those moments in your life? You've been through a divorce. You've been through a loss of a child. Something horrible that now is part of your testimony. Limps represent where we've struggled, where we need to submit. We have limps around our pride and our habit and our fear and our bluster. Limps around our appetite. We call that the belly. Limps around calamity in our life, failure in our life. And and, and the thing about a limp is you can't hide it. So many of these we want to hide. Maybe part of what I'm saying is let some of that be your testimony. Because there's somebody right behind you who needs to know. And any limp, Saipan Sam had a beautiful limp. Pastor Melinda has a beautiful face. How about you? God takes ashes and makes beauty. Let's pray. Father God, thank you for the story of Jacob, our ancestor in the faith, a broken man but a man you touched. And Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would do this for all of us. That each person here, you have an individual relationship and you're appearing to them right now through your word. Dressed in clothing they can see. And Father, help us to see that perhaps we're the truck driver that needs to speak to that other truck driver. We're the single mother that needs to speak to that other single mother. We're the stay-at-home mom or the overworked dad or the soccer coach. Whatever it is, maybe that's how Christ you want to work through us and help us not to despise when somebody is doing that for us. And Lord, where we're broken and you have made us whole, where we're weak and you've made us strong, Lord, glorify yourself. In Jesus' name we pray it. Amen.